see my title up here. It's a bit strange. <coughs> Many deaf individuals have similar experiences as me. It's the opposite of a spoonerism. Mm -hmm. Do you know what spoonerism is? Yes, do you know what a spoonerism is? Anyone, anyone have an example of a spoonerism? It's where you misspeak or kind of, you know, show embarrassing desires or something similar to that case. Well, this is something I hear, and I think I hear it one way, and I'm saying it this way, like a butter up in a doggy dog world, <laughs> until finally somebody explains to me that that's not the way I'm supposed to say it, and it's embarrassing. So it really should be dog eat dog world. Have you heard that before? It's an English idiom. It means, oh, wow, they are competitive. They will, you know, do their best to beat you, or I'm going to beat you, you know, that kind of thing. Very competitive. Now, if I misunderstand or misheard, I misheard for butter up in a doggy dog world. But I like it because it's more friendly, right? It's cute, a doggy dog. It's more supportive. I think it fits you all very well. It fits the Bridges program, right? We support each other in a big way. This is a very, very special and unique thing to have, a resource here to support each other. I'm very proud to be here and I'm proud of the Bridges program. I thank NTID for establishing the Bridges program, Dr. Hauser for being involved in everyone. It means a lot to me to be involved with this endeavor. I want to live up to the wow expectation, right? I did watch a few past lectures. I also talked with Peter about what is expected of me. I wasn't sure about presenting completely scientifically, and he explained that we want to see more about mentoring experience and how I got to this point, as he mentioned previously. Now, this is a very different experience for me. I haven't done a presentation like this before. I enjoyed preparing to talk about how I got here. And there's something else that I have never experienced in my life. And I'm not sure why. No one has ever sat down with me and said, Rain, this is how it works. Rain, I'm going to tell you how your personal life is going to go, how to balance your children and life and everything with work. I mean, yes, I balance with um, friends, or I've talked with friends about how to balance, but that never happened with mentors or advisors or anyone else in my experience. So I plan to put it all out there for you all and talk about the in intersection of my personal life and how it intersects with my work. Now, for the academic journey part of my story, the academic seas, the journey through or navigating through academic seas. This is what I envision. It's a good picture, right? <laughs> Some people sail along, they run into an obstacle and go off track, and they don't have a straight path in life. Sometimes they face an obstacle and they wonder what they do, figure out if they should play, change their plan, change their major, and that's okay. But really, my journey was very straight. It was a pretty straight path. Very interesting, and I'll be showing a little more about that later. My outline for today, I'll be talking about my experience growing up and identifying myself as a deaf person, going through school. I will also throw out some examples of research projects that I've done because I am aware that students, you all might be interested in, I can give you some ideas about how to go along with your research and progress through that. But first, before I get into my research experiences, and before I show you baby pictures, 
I want to talk about you as deaf people and how you got started as a deaf person. You all. I want you to think about that. It's interesting. I think there are two cohorts. On the far right. Now, young adults and children have um, technology to test at birth. They use an um, active brain recognition software while they're sleeping. They can tell if the baby is, can hear or not, and if they're not sure, they can just test again and test again until they're absolutely sure whether a child has, uh, is deaf or not. And that's today. The National Institutes of Health have a goal or a target of effective detection and they want all babies to be tested. And they can 90% of all babies. 90%? Yep. And they can test 90% of all babies. They want that rate. On the far left, <laughs> way over there, <laughs> old people like me fall in that area. Our parents had to rely on common sense and interaction with the baby. Often parents would say, there's something different about my baby. I don't know what exactly. And that fact has implications. Obviously, you know the statistics. Nine out of ten deaf babies are born to hearing parents, and most of them, well, maybe not here in Rochester, but other parts of the nation, hearing parents often have never met another deaf person, ever. And the first deaf person they meet is their own child, and they don't know what to do in that situation. Imagine the baby is two days old, and the parents, hearing parents find out the baby is deaf. Typically what happens is they get the medical view, as you can read here. And this is an official statement from the American Academy of Pediatrics Preventative Task Force statement. And that statement and what they hear from their doctors is how they take the statement. I'm sorry, it's a loss. It's a diagnosis or your baby has been diagnosed with, and that's more of a negative term. It kind of has a stigma related to, us, related to it, but I think all of us, I think that's how all of us start as deaf people. We think we're different or we're labeled as different. I wanted to put that out there first because my research can benefit us and how we can prevent or um, prove that this is not true, this statement. Now, I want to also caution you not to blame parents. This is what they get from the beginning. They don't have other deaf people interacting and helping with their decisions, so we need to partner with the, the parents as well. One consequence I've noticed through interviews with deaf people is that often they express guilt. Like they feel like they are the cause of child's the child's hearing loss. It's funny how when humans are faced with a loss, we tend to ask why. Why did my mom get cancer, for example? Or why did my grandfather have to die? But with positive things, like I got married, we never ask why. We only ask why for the more negative associated things. I've collected stories. There are examples. It's a pers personal interest of mine to collect these stories, not part of my research. Uh, I'm not sure exactly how much time I have, um, quite a bit still, but I grew up in LA, Los Angeles, and I was asked why, or I asked one person why they were deaf, 
And he said, well, my mom told me I was playing with a candle and I poured wax in my ear and that's why I'm deaf in both ears. And sometimes they just completely accept and internalize what their parents say and they don't think about it for themselves. The second one was a deaf friend, professor, very smart woman, and I asked her why. And she said, my grandmother told me that, or my mom told me that one day my grandmother took me out on a stroll on a beautiful day. And we were sitting near a train and the you know, train rushed by and it was so loud that I became deaf. Another example, I used to work in something like a hospital and a nurse who worked there ran clinical trials for uh, the medical studies that they were doing. We were just talking one day and she told me that her sister, um, her sister's child was deaf. I asked her why or she knew why and her sister said that she bumped the table while she was pregnant hit her belly on the table and the child became deaf. And then the last example, it's now my turn and my story. <laughs> my parents have a story too, of course. I'll tell you in just a minute. Well, my parents said, I don't know. They thought one day or well, one time, I had a little bit of a cold all babies have colds. They thought maybe it was a cold. Plus they took me to visit my grandparents and we flew and they think that's why I became deaf because I had a cold and I flew on an airplane. But it's very interesting. All of these people are intelligent but they're not using logic. I even met one person who has many family members who are deaf, and I asked why, and he said they're all, they were all sick. But the reason is possibly because they were born hearing and became deaf. So they think possibly if they're not born deaf and they acquire um, deafness, um, some, some genetic forms are progressive. You aren't always born with them. In reality, this is a very important part of deaf identity. Most often, they don't know why they're deaf. Or probably 50% of the time, people don't know the cause of their hearing loss. But we are all scientists. We're all curious. We all want explanations. I think that's part of why we're all here today and why I'm here, why I'm a scientist indeed. Because being deaf has forced me to ask why and ask questions about many things. Now, if you're hearing or if you're not faced with obstacles, there's no reason to ask why or question why things happen. That's the beginning of science, that curiosity, that natural inclination to ask why. So there's one thing in common with these pictures. Can anyone find it? Oh, I forgot to say something else first about my parents. They're hearing people. Forgot to tell you that. I mean, if it wasn't obvious enough, you could probably guess it. But uh, my parents are hearing individuals, which means that I was born in a foreign country. It, that's what it felt like. I mean, really, that was my experience. It's the best analogy I can come up with. Oftentimes, I look puzzled. But I was playing the piano, and I was a deaf kid. Sounds funny, right? <laughs> One thing, remember what I asked about, you know, what's in common with these pictures here? Anything? Anything at all? Ideas? No, no, not that. Oh. Yes, I'm going to talk about that happiness in a second, but I don't think you'll guess it. I'm trying to make you guess it, though. Can anyone come up with it? 
My parents had no idea that I was deaf in any of those pictures. Yeah. I'm about one or two in that picture. No, my parents finally figured it out when I was three and a half. And we can talk more about that in a second. But as you can tell from these pictures, I'm a smiling kid. Remember that one graph that um, you know we were talking about diagnosing deaf kids and all that? I was born before that cutoff. There was no anxiety about having me as a kid. All I was shown was love and affection and touch. And that's the only way you can really talk to a child at that age. It's not a language, it's a touch. I mean, kids can't express themselves formally, but it's that love and care that you can feel. <laughs> so, is anyone, can anyone guess? What's wrong with this picture? It's kind of funky, right? Does anyone know Freud, the psychologist? He came up with the Electra Complex, and I might be a good case for him. I called my parents by their first names. I don't know why I did, but I always have. My best guess is because whenever I would look up, I would see them moving their mouths, and I just would do what they did. And so if person called Dad Bobby, I would call Dad Bobby. So that's just what I knew from other people. And that went on for a while. I was such a jovial child, really. So read this uh, note from my mom. It's a really nice note. My mom was trying to show her, uh, what do you call it? Her resolve, I guess. Does anyone have a sign for that? Um, well, not like it when I see in the audience. More like her, her you know, her steadfastness. Kind of stubbornness almost. No, not quite, that might be too strong a word. But it, it's almost like a determination to want to fix something. Determination, that's the word, caught the interpreter. Yeah, thank you, Matt. <laughs> Tried to find that right word, I just wanted to fit it in there. Determination, that's what it was. So my mom had this moment where she needed to fix it and she, fix it all. So she wrote all this out. On the top you see those letters, CCS. And that stood for critical child services, rather crippled child services. So I was diagnosed at the John Tracy Clinic in LA. So what's going on in these pictures now? What's happening? So you're right. You can't really see because of the way my head is oriented, but look at where it's pointing. Look at where I'm looking. There's a book in my dad's lap, but I'm looking the opposite direction. And I'm a baby, but I know that I need to lip read and I know where to look. And I was not aided at this time. Hearing aids in the right picture. I included this because um, I thought it might be beneficial for you all as students and trying to read an audiogram. I had my first audiogram at three and a half. And it really wasn't that bad. I kind of was right in the middle of the speech range. It was a moderate hearing loss. So do you see that long dashed line right in the middle? That's the, of the speech banana? It's that yellow line right there? I mean, maybe that's why. I, I could kind of hear some of those vowels based on my audiogram, but you know, I had trouble with like the S sound. It's really high pitch consonants that I struggle with, but my vowels are pretty much there. So I was retested at five, and I was on a very different plane at that point. I was, uh, considered severe to profound at that point. So, maybe it's progressive. We're progressive for progressive. 
however we want to sign it. Maybe it was a progressive loss, which could have been passed on through my family. And this is my uh, most recent audiogram, which is roughly the same. So from about the age of five to now, I have plateaued. So I, I definitely benefited from hearing aids. I don't wear mine all the time, but when I do, it's pretty much, you know, I can pick up sounds. However, uh, spoken speech, I cannot understand. I can identify one's voice, but not what they're saying necessarily. <laughs> Funny, right? I know, I hated my hearing aids. I used to actually leave them out on the playground when I could at school. <laughs> There were a couple times I can remember my mom, well, we used to go to a, a public pool, and they would be in the bottom of the pool or something, so <laughs> wasn't too keen on them. My parents had a lot of grief over my hearing aids. And then in this picture, it kind of comes into conflict with everything else. I don't know how old I was, but um, I definitely remember what happened. We went to some kind of spiritual temple, and they were doing that, um, you know, with their hands. They put their hands on my ears and were trying to come up with different curses and spells to fix me. And I remember when we left, I was like, Dad, what happened? And he was starting to get teary teared up. He said to me something along the lines of, um, we brought you, I don't know what it was called. It was like a, um, like a Chinese medicine, like an Eastern approach. It was something that was supposed to be homeopathic. And this was way back when. So the doctor told my parents that they fed me too much milk, and that was what happened. That's why I was deaf. So yeah, have a read. Oh. Hi, Mom, Dad. I'm lecturing for a class on deaf culture, and my topic is about parents' reactions to finding out their child is deaf. Can you send me a short bit on your thoughts on this? Rain. Dad's answer. When we first received the diagnosis that you were hard of hearing, I wanted to get a second opinion. I was adamant that the test was wrong. Then during your retest, I wanted so bad to hear for you, but had to recognize the fact that you couldn't hear certain frequencies. That turned out to be a special day because that's when mom and I faced the hurdles we could start to jump over with you. And we made all the new connections to get guidance to do that. Now, the problem here is that back then, there were no resources for parents. It was nothing then. I mean, sure, things are in a different place now, but when I grew up, I remember my parents just feeling stuck. We were told quite adamantly to use lip reading with you. We also inquired about schools, and we were also advised not to take you out of the mainstream classes. I wanted to find a deaf school for you, but was strongly advised to stay in the mainstream public school system. So I promised my friends I would use this picture. <laughs> The top one is my mom's passport photo. Again, my mom at that time has no idea that I'm deaf. We were shocked because we had no experience with deafness and had none in the family. Also, we were in denial for a while, thinking that it was wax in your ears. We didn't realize right away because you compensated so well and were so smart and happy. Our neighbor said you weren't hearing her, and so I immediately began testing from behind you. Later, when we were at the park, you were running by me and I was yelling at you. I could see by your dreamy smile that you weren't really being naughty by simply ignoring me. <laughs> the boxes, being aided, having those packs on, taking them off at the end of the day for recess. We would be all over the place. I remember I was in a deaf and hard of hearing mainstream program. Here's where I was. Hot pink building. Western California. <laughs> Hollywood. Already out of the closet. We were not allowed to use sign language. I mean, mildly punished if we were using any visual language. But it was interesting. 
The first time that I signed was actually on a bus. I think it was like one program all got together. So kids from all over were bused into the same place, to one school. And we were coming from all over the place. So I remember that the bus was probably about an hour every day. I would pass out because I was a kid. I was so shot by the end of the day. So we would get on the bus in the morning for an hour and my day on the bus for an hour. And I remember getting home completely exhausted. My parents decided that that was it. No more. So they moved me over to a school where I was the only one oh, okay. across the street, where I was the only one. <laughs> Now, middle school and high school, where I was the only one. I was at a private Catholic girls' school where I had a very nice education, yes, but I was not required to comply with the Americans with Disabilities Act. They completely poo-pooed it and told me that it was something that I had to take care of. And that's where the dog-eat-dog -dog world comes in, this place. It was tough. I was, I mean, I, I was in tears regularly. I felt lost. And all I wanted so much was to do well. But I kept encountering mistakes. Like, a simple thing would be like, um, I mean, every day I just kind of felt like I was missing out on something. Or sometimes I had a, you know, the PA every day would do the morning announcements. And I can remember clearly one day we were in class and everyone was so excited about something. And this was after the announcements. So, well, first, everyone is, you know, very carefully listening with their ears, and then is, everyone's happy. All the girls are super excited. Then I asked one of my friends, what happened? She said, oh, it's a free dress day. Means we don't have to wear our uniforms, which was great. And for me, I was so excited. So I showed up the next day in my own plain clothes, and I was the only one. Because it wasn't free dress day after all. So I kind of just went back to my corner. But the teachers, they didn't simply understand how to deal with me or take care of me in any capacity. So my parents told me, no more. And again, I was pulled from that program to look for another solution. So then I went over to a public high school in LA. And I was there with a lot of crime in the area. There were metal detectors in the building. We had gangs. It's the heart of LA. The expectations there for the students were to just show up to class and wow, you were a star student. So for me there, you know, bright and innocent and giddy, I just got A's the whole time because I showed face. <laughs> that was it. That was the expectation. The bar was set so low in that public school. And this was the complete polar experience to what I had in the Catholic school. In that girls' school, the expectations were beyond advanced and left me struggling. I felt drowned. But in the public school, they were able to help without a real investment. I mean, I got A's because they said, oh, hey, Rain showed up and everyone else was just ditching class. So Rain gets A's, and of course they love me for that. But with one exception here. The coach hated me, hated me, oh my gosh. He would look at me and just tell me that I sucked. And, and I guess I was kind of cruddy at basketball anyway, but. So personal part of things. So I talked a little bit to my career um, and the impact that it's had on my own family. And of course, my children in my family have had an impact on my career. And you know, the pros and cons that come with that are just a part of life. You got to roll with it. So I have four kids. Yep, two of them are mine, and two of them are uh, have been mine for uh, a, a while. I was remarried. So this Friday, I'm flying out to Gallaudet University for a graduation ceremony for my deaf daughter, stepdaughter. There she is. Congrats to her. So I went to school at the University of California, San Diego. And overall, it was truly a nice experience. I rather enjoyed myself. Of course, I did feel isolated. And in some ways, it was a challenge. But 
I was able to survive thanks to a few good friends, quite a few. So it was positive in some regards. So I got there for my undergraduate program, and my first major was in That's what I wanted to do, urban studies and planning and forestry science. I thought that I wanted to research bear scat and really get into the migration patterns of bears, where they start, where they go, the human impact on bears, and all that fun stuff. And I really loved it. But there was one day that someone told me, they were giving me a face more than anything, and they were just like, why? It was just this cruddy attitude. They said, what do you mean? You can't do that. It's, you're deaf. You can't go into the forest on your own. It's too dangerous, and the pay sucks, and how are you going to have a family? And to me, it really rang true. I, I was very naive and kind of a follower. I didn't have my parents there, so this person kind of just took me under their wing. But I do. I love backpacking. I love going out and making my own adventure. Now, I still envision myself doing this. I had to give up a little, you know, sacrifice a little bit, but I hope to have some of this in my life still. UCSD was a wonderful experience for me because of the most amazing mentors that I had. It was like I won the lottery, truly. I had no idea that these researchers and scientists were there until I actually arrived at the university. I do have to credit myself, actually, because how I found them, I'm li I really like the ranger that I wanted to be. I did look. I searched in my own backyard. I didn't, uh, you know, ignore what was right around me. And I paid attention to who was important and who was who in that area. I found these people, and they really impacted me so very much. I planned to say a bit about each of these individuals, but I think for the sake of time, I'll go on. But if you want to know how they each impacted me, we can talk after the presentation or at some other time. And of course, there are amazing books that these individuals have written that have had a large impact on my life and my career. Okay, now deep breath. And we'll talk about research. <laughs> All right, we'll start with the big picture and then narrow it down a little bit. So the big picture is I study deaf people and the importance of sign language. There are many theories about language and cognition, but we need if it's really universal, it should apply to deaf people also. So studying these individuals can help us to learn which structures of the language are universal and what are based on the modality, speech versus signed language. In Dr. Hauser's uh, work, we consider, or he considers, parts of cognition and how they impact language. Is everything okay? Just some tech difficulties. I just fell in love with this topic. I, I'm not sure why it impacted me so much, but probably a similar reason to it impacting you. I'm sure one day, Deaf people have the realization of, oh, I'm special. It's not a negative thing to be deaf, but deaf gain. You know that there are moments of the similarity, but the unique benefits that deaf individuals have. Similarly as language. There was a moment from uh, mentors and their impact on me that I found that ASL is very rich. American Sign Language is wonderful and beautiful and such 
an amazing language. A simple example is phonemes. ASL has phonemes, and wow, the first time I found that out, I was just amazed. Another thing that was amazing for me about linguistics. Well, not really linguistics, but human language in general. I was floored, I mean, just simply amazed that we all have rules that we follow. I always thought. Yeah, somebody writes a dictionary and gives it to us, similar to God, or I thought it was the president, you know, maybe the president who invented language when I was growing up. Of course, even when I got to college, I didn't completely understand that language is yours. Language is mine. It's not theirs. They're just some abstract concept. And I'll give some examples. This gentleman here, David Perlmutter and David Swinney. They were my first teachers in my undergrad career who taught me about the psychology of language and linguistics. David Perlmutter is a former, linguist. a former linguist. Well, both of them are, but David Swinney is a psycholinguist. And then a linguist, uh, Dr. Perlmutter is a linguist. So I showed up to class. And the first example that I was just blown away with was it doesn't really exist in ASL, but you can take a word absolutely, absolutely. Does, does that do you understand? We broke it up. So with ASL, do it again. You're right. It doesn't work. Try it a different way, it doesn't work. It just doesn't work. Anybody? Try it yourself. Suppose you say, abso fucking lutely. That's not, that works fine. But if you try to say, abso fuckly, it doesn't work. I mean, it doesn't roll off the, term, uh, off the tongue like it should. Does that make sense? How you interject another word into another word? Some ways it sounds appropriate or sounds good and some it doesn't. So I agreed with him that rules are good, but sometimes you have to break rules or rules are broken, broken and that was just absolutely fascinating for me. Now I think I'll give you possibly two examples depending on time. For my master's thesis, I worked with Karen Emery. I was interested in identity, you know, uh, when it, or I iconicity, when a sign looks like what it actually is, umbrella or drink or cup, that's iconic. And then words like music or signs like music or library are not iconic. Giraffe is iconic, but rat is not so much. So, if you can imagine what your brain looks like, the dictionary for all the words. Where, do, where is the dictionary in your brain? Or try and think of a website, what it looks like. I don't know, I don't know what it looks like. I try to Google, what does the World Wide Web look like? Um, hard to find anything concrete about that. So there are connections between cells happening within your brain, millions and millions of, and maybe even trillions of connections going on in your brain. And your memories are stored in those connections. That's your dictionary. Well, how is it organized though? How do I go find one word and then find a different word quickly? Imagine you're a librarian of your own brain. How do you go find the word that you're looking for so quickly? How does it work? Is it alphabetical order? <laughs> Those are the types of questions that people were asking back at this time when I started my thesis work. I was, I was curious about iconicity. And if that was a property that represents or is represented in the brain. Going back to David Swinney, who unfortunately passed away. I love him, he was a wonderful man. 
He invented this technique, the lexical decision task. He came up with priming, really, and it became the lexical decision task. So what you do for this task? Dave Sweeney was really the first person who used real-time testing to study the brain and how it's organized. Before, it was more uh, offline, and let me think about that, and then respond. You know, a lot of things can inhibit your response, but he wanted a real-time, accurate representative of your brain, representation of your brain and your mind. So there were quick trials where you ask the person to just say yes or no, if it's a word or is not a word. And there, were, there are variations of this now, but I will show you this example of what we originally used. You might see a word like guitar signed. You say yes or no. And then a word that's not actually a word, like this, and you'll say no, the, or the subject will respond no. I'm trying to think of an English example, but you, you understood that there are words that are possible or not. So you say yes or no. Now, what my subjects did not know, we were manipulating the relationship between the order of the words. If they saw the guitar and then the piano, we wondered if they would be faster at responding to piano. And the answer is yes. There is a strong semantic priming correlation or relationship. That's because you're facilitating the neurons or brain cells in your brain. They're getting excited and they're getting started and activated. And now something shows up next that is related and they're already excited and so they just latch on to that. But iconicity may help as well. And if it does, that means it's important for your mental dictionary. Suppose you see guitar and then music these signs right after each other and we measure your reaction time and then we compare guitar followed by piano and we measure reaction time for that. The three pictures you see are called experimental conditions within subjects and we mix it up, analyze if there's a difference between them. So if iconicity facilitates recall, then the prime word that's iconic, or they'll um, react faster to one that's iconic versus one that's not iconic. And there was no difference. My dissertation was on motion perception. It's called psychophysics. It's a technique used to measure the threshold. <laughs> Fingers smelling fast. I'm a little bit nervous, but uh, it measures the threshold for seeing motion. Now, I'm interested in this concept out there that deaf people have expert vision. And I wanted to test that in different ways to see if deaf individuals have supervision. It's a popular idea. If you isolate specific simple tasks, you don't see much of an improvement. But I do see deaf individuals improve with periphery. And that's partly from uh, Matt Dye and Peter Hauser have worked on those studies, studying the deaf individual's peripheral vision. And I uh, wrote about that also in my dissertation. I'm not sure if it's true everywhere, but it's what's called a staple thesis. I still had to 
write a package of sorts with the introduction. Chapter was paper one, and then the transitions. I still had to put together a packet that looked like a dissertation. However, I was able to use the papers to include in there. That helped my career quite a bit. It was a wonderful thing that I did that. I'm happy that I rolled up my sleeves to publish before I finished school. I did my master's degree with uh, Karen Emery for a year, and then I worked on my later part of my dissertation for an, another year and a half. Then for my postdoctoral fellowship, the Retina Foundation of the Southwest in Dallas, Texas. I was there for almost four years. Something happened on the way. I became pregnant. Oops. Uh, so I got to Dallas. Well, well, okay. So I had spousal issues. What you call two body problems. You know, you're you know trying to go one place, and the university or location has to hire two people or whatever. So I finished graduate school. My husband got his PhD prior to me, got a good job in Dallas. And so I realized, ooh, I needed to search for something there. And I found the RFS, the Retina Foundation of the Southwest. And oh, there was a famous place. I thought this would be great. Um, I really was not looking forward to working with babies. Ugh, I did not want to work with babies. But then I got pregnant, so <laughs> I first moved, worked on my dissertation, flew back, seven months pregnant, and my committee had no idea for my defense that I was pregnant ahead of time. So I'm standing there for my dissertation, all, you know, seven months pregnant, and they were convinced that they couldn't fail us because they had to pass us. You know, what if there was an emergency and she has the baby while she's here? So I was seven months pregnant, did my dissertation, came back and started my postdoc. So I flew home, had my baby shower on Monday, had my defense, my dissertation defense on Wednesday, flew back on Friday to Dallas and started my new job the following Monday. And I worked training for about two months, went through the learning process, learning this job, how to work with blind babies and children. It was clinical, it was different. Uh, my dissertation was basic science, this was clinical work. I then had a short leave because of the, having the baby, and it was nice because academics, you can be flexible about hours. So I built up my hours, but went back full time very quickly. It was fascinating work, and I published several papers during my time here. There was one baby that was born blind, and then they had surgery, and they were wondering how long after they were able to see, or if a baby was um, born blind with a cataract, and then they had surgery to remove the cataract, suppose at six months. We wondered if that was possible. Would they be able to see after that surgery? We can measure the critical period for these babies. My own topic was strabismus, strabismus. And that was interesting because the eyes um, turn in and can't verge, converge in the brain. They're supposed to converge together, but they can't if one is off for, from the other. So I research motion perception in those children. We used clinical tools. I learned a lot about variety of testing methods and uh, diagnosis, visual and functional Abilities. <laughs> this is me with my child. I was able to bring them and test them too. I thought that was nice. I liked testing babies because, oh, well, I could bring my own baby and use the electrodes and test and do the metrics and everything on my baby. 
We did BP. I loved that work because that means that you measure the actual activity in the brain. And you can attach electrodes to the back and measure from the back. Because you might ask a baby, can you see this and tell me what you can see? And they can't report anything. So they just have to sit there and watch what's happening. And we just measure their brain activity. If you see quite a spike or, you know, if it spikes, you can see it very clearly. Some of the, some of the kids that we tested were very nonverbal. So this was a good tool to use with them. <laughs> brought my kid. I only had one son at that time. So for conferences, meetings, I would bring him along. So currently, I'm a research scientist, and that's the position that I serve in. I'm not in a tenure track. I'm not in a permanent position. I do strictly uh, rely on what's called soft money, which means that I'm dependent on getting grants in an effort to support myself. And let's hold on for a sec. So it's nice in the sense that it gives me a lot of flexibility and my career is wonderful as far as what I do in the position that I have. However, that kind of you know, unknown about if I'll be there in the long term is challenging in its own way. I was able to move back to the University of California's San Diego because of that two-body problem again. My husband was hired for another position in San Diego, which was funny to me because, you know, I mean, it's beautiful and people think that we missed La Jolla County. Um, because it's a beautiful place in San Diego, but it's, I, I didn't want to be out west. I really didn't. I'd already been there, done that, but my husband had a really, really wonderful opportunity, director of R&D for the uh, Pfizer. So, but yeah, I mean, it was a great opportunity for him, truly, just right next to UCSD, which was wonderful as well. So for us, we were starting to plan, and I was wondering, what do I do? I went ahead and applied for my own grant, and I got it. And then I went to UCSD and I said, hey, hey guys, look at me. Look what I got. You want a piece? You want to hire me? And they brought me on board. <laughs> so this is my start. I got a grant with Karen Emery. Nope, Karen. Karen Dobkins. And that was fun because now I was able to work with babies. And you see this um, set of slides up here with uh, vision development. Babies can't see necessarily very well at first. And that's in many ways. It's not just like vaguety, but colors don't come in to play, motion as well, as well as the control of where the eyes gaze. All of those abilities emerge over time as the baby develops. So I don't know if you remember, this whole time I've been talking about experiences and how it's shaped who I am as an individual. So I wanted to know if we can do this for babies. I mean, of course, it's unethical to, you know, put a baby in a closet for a few months or a red room or something. You can't. You can't do that, right? You can't do that. But I thought, how do we achieve this in another way? If a baby is premature, will it have any kind of different visual abilities? I had a grant that was studying newborn babies who are premature. So the logic behind this, how does it work? First, you have to recruit healthy babies. And you have to exclude those that have other issues like PBL and whatnot. Um, what are other issues? Lung problems, brain problems. Those are sometimes the case, but they are excluded from this study. So I took newborn babies that were born two to eight weeks early. And I know you think that eight weeks is quite a lot, but truly it's not. If you um, talk to medical doctors, you, you'll find out that most babies can be born, born quite early on and survive just fine. There'll be complications, sure, but eight weeks is just as doable as a full term, and they can go home within that week after birth. So imagine that, you know, eight weeks extra in the dark as opposed to eight weeks out in the world. I mean, granted, they're not out and about. They're lying in a crib more than likely, looking around, seeing their, you know, colors and faces and toys. But do those eight weeks give a head start? So here's an example. Let's say there's a baby that's uh, 
expected to be due. Um, tell us the due three expected to be due, due. yeah, biological in three months. Biological so the biological plan biological says three more months, but they were born a couple months early. Oh, so technically, yeah, five they're months. five months at this they point. They have different ages, essentially. Okay. Does that make sense how yeah. that's done? So that baby in the middle is more like which? So I was testing two competing hypotheses. If there's a baby that was three months early, does it give it extra time out in the world and a benefit as opposed to a baby that has three extra months in the womb? So we were able to test hypotheses about the ages of babies as far as when they were born, if it was early, and if there were more time out in the world, and if that had any gain for them. So I tested roughly 50 babies. I did, 150 babies, with uh, an assistant who was in my lab. Now, this is what we tested. We looked at the sensitivity to dark and light colors. Uh, that's just the general gist of it. It's color-based. You can think of it that way. We'll keep it simple. Now, I have you know, quite a few graphs that show uh, there are uh, lines over age and whatnot, but we'll keep that out of the equation for now. Take my word for it. <laughs> it's is much more simple to think about it this way. This formula on the bottom. So that result means that if a baby were to be born eight weeks premature, they do have a gain. They will have an accelerated visual development by about four weeks. So it's eight over two, like the equation says up here. Pretty interesting, no? It's really cool work for me. Any questions on this? You're more than welcome to. I was really, really <laughs> excited about this work. I was able to submit more grants. You know, my grant was starting to wind down, coming to the end of our cycle. So I want to say I submitted one, two, three that were denied. Didn't receive funding for any of those. I want to say that I was maybe three months solid of just grant writing, and I got nothing. Failed. So, what do I have to do? so where do I go from here? I would, rather be I would much rather be put in boiling water than teach, personally. <laughs>
They can give me yes or no recommendations, and they can recommend teachers, and they can also add comments. So they would just tell me in these comments for these evals that, evals that they hated the book. But I got hundreds across the board for everything else. It was the book they weren't too uh, keen on. And then I got money, cha-ching! <laughs> it's interesting for me. Now, well, what did you learn from my st story? I studied deaf adults, I learned about psychophysics, I conducted psychophysics with blind infants, and from there, I started moving into, well, moving back to San Diego, I moved back to atypical, or two typical babies. So what was next? What do you think the connection is for me? Deaf. And babies, together. Yeah, deaf babies. So of course, that's the next step in my progression. So I went ahead and wrote a grant. I was the PI, and Karen Dobkins was the co-PI, so flip the tables a little. But we were able to study <laughs> deaf children. We did something that's kind of uh, not something that we knew or were confident in doing. We had two agencies. And we bidded with NSF and NIH. You're not allowed to accept both funding at the same time, funding from both institutes at the same time, but we did submit. And there was an interesting problem. Do you want to guess what happened? Yeah, they both wanted to give us money, and I'm like, shit, what do we do? So we had to tell one no and one yes. So we went ahead and explained. I remember that Karen and I um, had interpreters in our office, and we got on the phone with, well, I had an, hired an interpreter specifically for this call. So they sat with me while Karen was on the speakerphone. And she spoke to both. It was called the PO, or a program officer, for each of these institutes. And it felt almost like we were negotiating with them because they both wanted to fund us. So we had to kind of split things as far as our aims were concerned. Now, <laughs> We thought that we would end up with more money, but that was not the case. We actually ended up with less money. Yeah, I know, it's odd. Well, and this was because the NIH is huge and the NSF is smaller. So the rules say you gotta find a logical way to split the science, really. It's not kind of like, oh, I'm going to carve this aim here and half of that aim over there. No, 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 no. It's got to be nice, clear, clean, and cut. So we would have half of our work with one agency and half of our work with the other. And the aims, essentially, were just evenly divided, two and two. And guess what happened? The big place, the NIH, cut in half, was a pretty severe cut. I thought someone would explain that to me, that it wasn't going to be half and half of the big amount. Instead, I got half of one. and half of something else. So all along, I was in the infant and visual lab, which we changed the name because um, we are now the MEP lab, the Mind, Experience, and Perception lab, which is uh, what I like and what we went with. And this is my son, again, back in the lab. He's a subject here. He hates it. He does not care for science at all. I don't know, he's just not, uh, not inspired by me, I don't know. I'm just going to touch briefly on this. We do not do brain imaging, but we do model our tests based on what we are aware of regarding the brain from other people. So we know that you know, this part of the brain processes function X, and you know, that other part of the brain processes function Y. But our tests are more focused on tapping object A, or you know, tapping key B. So it's more like that as opposed to actual imaging. Lots of work coming up with uh, different metrics as well as perceptional measures that we've been using. We call it a battery of tests, really. And we use uh, Dr. Hauser's ASL um, comprehension test for the adult subjects. And we have another test that's similar that we employ with children. So that's me, and I'm testing twins here. 
I was uh, allowed from mom to show these pictures, so she signed off on the releases. These are twin boys that are implanted, and they're just the sweetest thing. <laughs> Cute, right? They don't speak much. Um, they are implanted, but I want to say that they're maybe two, so there's not a whole lot of talking going on yet, but we'll keep going. And this is more eye tracking equipment. It's like um, a mean IQ test. So you can tell them apart because of the headbands that they wear. So we, they help keep the implants on and you can tell them apart. So future work. I want to know how babies can, identif can identify language. When they see a word, like um, if a baby were to see that, all that futzing around, we don't call it language. It's not necessarily a word in sign language, but babies are able to discern that difference based on what they hear, maybe auditarily, and can tell what's garbled and what's language. It's the idea that internally we do have language sensitivity, universally, and that humans are designed in a way to actually identify language and take to it. That's why babies are so good at learning language. We're interested in learning more about how babies can truly recognize the signals within their environment that dictate true language and not. So I'm testing babies again. They aren't deaf. They are either uh, children of deaf adults who use sign language that have deaf parents, and they are hearing babies and then those babies that don't have any exposure to signed language. So what I do is compare those two and figure out how we can identify language. How early can you identify that in a child if a language is truly their first language or not? And with CODA children, I'm able to identify this at about six months, which is just really outstanding. We're gonna end with this nice metaphor, or an idiom. People say that my life is like an open book. And I kind of identify with that. The funny thing is, when I was you know, in graduate school and studying a certain topic, after that, I found myself in a new place, and I had to say goodbye to that first topic. And then after I finished up that paper, I found a new topic, and I had to say goodbye. And it felt rude. I had to stop and go on to teaching after research, and giving up all of these different things and hopping all over the place. But that was not the case. So before I say that that, that was wrong, I want to explain my metaphor. I expected that my life to be, you know, like graduate school. Like, all right, after I finish that book, I can hang it back up on my shelf. And then after I read for my, I mean, you don't really reread, right? Once you've read something, you just kind of throw it back up on the shelf. So I close my PhD, close my postdoc, and just start to fill up my own personal library. But that's not the case. You don't think about your life as a bunch of books. Instead, these are chapters, because it's a cohesive journey that guides you from your adolescence, where I certainly didn't identify anything like that. But it's been a beautiful part of my life to slowly watch all of these different aspects come into play and go back and think about how everything truly is related. So every aspect of my life has been a chapter, not its own book. So, full circle, talking about those C's again. What can I pass on to you? I suggest that you just try to do it. Don't think too much about it, just do it. That's why, you know, I was saying that my path is very direct. It's not that I was hopping all over the place. I kind of just found myself working and moving forward and not worrying about what had happened, but focusing on what I could make happen. Oh, and back to that butter up, kind of like brown nosing. You have to show enthusiasm to your seniors, especially mentors. You need to exhibit that kind of enthusiasm for their work. I don't care if you fake it. You have to show it. And if it's not fake, you know, enjoy it. But fake it if you have to. <coughs> the best way, if you're a really shy person like me, is to use the emails. Emails are the best. Just opening with a nice hello that I'm a student that is interested in working and you're working with you. Could I visit during office hours? It's a great icebreaker, but you need to show that enthusiasm and work hard. <laughs>